reminds us of that. The passage of Scripture that we're talking about is, is about these little things. I think there's close to probably, I don't know, a thousand little mustard seeds in there. And uh, Robin and Marilyn are passing out a little bookmark for the adults um, that'll have one mustard seed on it along with the Scripture passage of Matthew 17, 20, which tells us, teaches us, that great things come from small beginnings. Jesus, preaching over 2,000 years ago, uh, wanted his listeners to be, to be familiar with uh, what he was saying so that they would understand exactly the truths that he's, he's telling in his illustrations of parables. And, and so we have these. And, and he uses one of the, the main uh, customs back during those times uh, that the people were familiar with, uh, and that was seed time and harvest, the agricultural side of business. Well, we saw last Sunday, Jesus said a farmer plants a seed, but he doesn't know how it grows. I got a disclaimer to make, um, and I think that Mike, if he had been here last week, would have probably talked to me afterwards and said, you know, that's not, that's not absolutely the truth. A farmer does know these days. We do know uh, how a seed grows. We know exactly how it grows. We know that heat and moisture cause the seed to germinate. It sends its roots downward for moisture and shoots upwards towards the sun. We know how a seed grows, but we don't know why a seed grows. So there's a bit of truth there and, and not because of where we are with technology today. The ultimate response to that, though, is this, that only God knows. Only God knows. Seeds are a mysterious yet mighty thing, as we see from this parable in these two verses of Mark chapter 4. Seeds have been found in the tombs of pharaohs. These 3,000-year-old seeds uh, were planted, and they began to grow. Jesus said in these parables, he was illustrating to us what the kingdom of God was like. The kingdom of God, we think sometimes, is a place that we're longing for, but really the kingdom of God is here and now. It's in you and I as we establish and surrender, submit more of ourselves to the leading of Jesus Christ and the power, empowering of his Holy Spirit so that we develop more Christ-like characters as we strive in our relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, Jesus says. That's being planted. And the only kind of mustard most of us are familiar with is the kind that we put on our hot dogs. Are we having hot dogs this afternoon? <laughs> but the reason Jesus talks about the mustard seed was because mustard plants were prolific around the Sea of Galilee. Now, these are yellow mustard seeds. There's a slide there. Yeah, is it up there? There you go. There are brown seeds as well. And when I was going through trying to get a picture of this, I saw the brown ones and I thought, my man, that doesn't look at all like what I got. And, uh, but that's because there's two different kinds, depending on where, where they're planted, I guess. Um, but there they are. They look pretty big in that picture, but as you can see from the uh, bookmark, the little bookmark that you've got there, they are very tiny. The reason Jesus talks about the mustard seed was because mustard plants were prolific around the Sea of Galilee. And so this morning as we look at Matthew cha or Mark chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 17, I want us to, to see three things with regards to the mustard seed and how we can relate to it. First of all, as verse 31 says in Mark chapter 4, it is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Well, another disclaimer, friends. The mustard seed isn't the smallest in the world, but 
It was the smallest seed which people in Israel were familiar with. It is tiny. It takes approximately, get this, 750 seeds to make a single gram. In other words, there are 28 grams in an ounce, which means there are 21,000 mustard seeds in an ounce. Now, when I was, Cheryl, Cheryl and I were doing those bookmarks, uh, trying to get those mustard seeds, I had the most difficult time trying to scoop them up with my fingers, and she said, wet your fingers and, and they'll stick. Well, they don't do that very well, neither. And uh, then they went all over the place, and boy, it was a real riot trying to get them back together. I can't imagine 21,000 mustard seeds on top of our desk. They would fill it. It's a tiny little seed, but it produces a very large plant, um, anywhere from 8 to 15 feet this plant, this mustard plant can reach. Um, it's actually a woody shrub that can take over anything in its way if it's allowed. Yet good things come from it. Mustard for our hot dogs. Sorry, keep bringing it up, make you hungry. And then for medicinal purpose, how many remember the, the good old mustard plaster when you had uh, a cold or something? You had to be careful with them, though, because they could burn you really bad. Um, so you'd have, yeah, use with caution. In truth, most people believe that nothing would come of Jesus in his ministry. Listen to what John chapter 7, verse 52 says. Look. Look into it, and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. So they knew who Jesus was, the son of Mary and Joseph, and they were saying, well, nothing really good comes out of a small place like Nazareth or Galilee, to be exact. They could see the tiny seed, but they couldn't see the great plant there are still many in our day who mock Jesus and make fun of his claims to be God in flesh and the only Savior of men. There are many who believe that Jesus never rose again from the dead. There are many who deny that he ever existed. Psalm 118 verse 22 says, the stone became the chief, the, the stone the builders have rejected becomes the chief cornerstone. You see, the kingdom of God, kingdom growth, started when God sent Jesus Christ, his son, into this world. He planted his son, Jesus Christ, in the, as the significant soil of a backwater province of Rome called Israel. He grew up there, he lived there, he died there, he rose again in the obscure place. He taught to get you to have, to get you, to give away what you have. He told people to love their enemies. He counseled men to turn the other cheek. He spoke of walking the second mile. Succeeding through serving, denying self, and the kingdom he founded continues to exist today and will exist tomorrow. Friends, what is it saying? God specializes in taking small, insignificant things and making them mighty. After the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, the Jews returned from exile and started to rebuild it. They had very little money and few materials. They were, there were many who doubted the temple could be rebuilt, but Zerubbabel, the governor, believed that it could and would happen. And so the prophet Zechariah wrote in Zechariah 4.10 these words, Who despises the day of small things? Men will rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. The temple was ultimately rebuilt, although it wasn't nearly as beautiful and ornate as it was during Solomon's time. It started, my friends, with the laying of one small stone. We go across this world of ours 
into various countries, and we see by the simple start laying of one small stone, mighty cathedrals have been built to worship in. God took David. We sang about it. God took David, youngest of eight children, and made a giant killing king out of his life. 1 Samuel chapter 17, if you want to read the story. God took a man by the name of Gideon from the weakest family in the tribe of Manasseh and used him as a great military leader in the book of Judges chapter 6 verse 15. You, as a child of God, he looked beyond what you were to see what you could become through his grace. He saved you. He planted you in Jesus Christ, and now your life is bearing fruit for his glory. Things start small, and they grow steadily, according to verse 32. It grows to become one of the largest plants with long branches where birds can come and find shelter. The mustard plant can grow to a height of 15 feet. That's a huge plant from such a tiny seed, isn't it? And since the time of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, God's kingdom has grown remarkably. The Christian way, as it was called in the, in the, in the writings of Acts, started with only a few people and has grown into a global family which is called the church universal. Jesus called 12 disciples to make up his inner core of believers. He told them, Go and change the world. And on the day of Pentecost, these disciples were joined by uh, 109 other people who were praying in the upper room. Acts chapter 1 verse 15 says, In those days Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. And those 120 folks prayed for 10 days straight. How many of us have done that lately? We used to do it. We're trying to do it. And on the day of Pentecost, what happened? The Holy Spirit came and filled the disciples and everyone else that was in that room. Peter preached a Pentecostal sermon. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verse 41 and 47, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And then it goes on to verse 47 where it says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Almost overnight, the church grew from 120 to 3,000. Talk about church growth. I know a lot of pastors that would like to have that one under their crown. And then to 5,000 in a matter of days. And today there are about, get this, 2.818 billion people that claim to be Christians. Consider what God is doing in China. In 1949, it was estimated there were less than 400,000 Christians in China. Today, a conservative estimate is that there are, did I say conservative? This is not a political pun. <laughs> Today, a conservative estimate is that there are 163 million Christians in China. That means that there are more Christians in China than in Canada. 24.9 million. But this number only represents 12% of China's population of 1.4 billion people. It grows steadily. And God's kingdom, kingdom growth, will continue until one day in heaven there will be a multitude too large to count. John describes this vision he had of the throne room of heaven. It says in Revelation 7, 9, 
After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the land. They shall come from the east, they shall come from the west, and sit down in the kingdom of God, both the young and the old, the rich, the poor, all will be gathered together if they've accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. This speaks of the future kingdom when Jesus will rule and reign over the whole earth upon his return. But for now, kingdom growth is within us. And just as a seed grows, we too grow toward Christian maturity. But what is the kingdom of God? The Bible says to us in Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Paul was addressing the fact that some Christians in Rome were still hung up on what a Christian should eat or drink, religious taboos. He reminded them that God's kingdom isn't about religious observances. It is about the righteousness we see in a relationship with Jesus Christ. It is about the inner peace we enjoy because of Jesus Christ. It is about the overflowing joy that we have in Him. And like a mustard seed, there should be a growing awareness of righteousness, peace, and joy in our lives. But there is one other way in which the mustard seed illustrates kingdom growth. And that is what it says in verse 32, the latter part. With long branches where birds can come and find shelter. Jesus describes the mustard plant. They are so huge that the birds can come and rest. It's not unusual to see small birds landing on the branches of the mustard plant. Some even build their nests in them. There's a spiritual application here, my friends. Just as the mustard seed provides shelter for the birds, we find protection and shelter in the kingdom, in kingdom growth. Psalm 91, verse 1, the psalmist says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Let me share with you at least three ways in which you can find shelter and protection from from God. First of all, rest from the weariness of life. Are you tired? Are you weary? Jesus has a personal invitation for you today. He says in Matthew eleven twenty eight twenty nine, 28, 29, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find what? Rest for your souls. Just as the birds find rest and, and shelter in the mustard plants, the mustard shrubs, We can find rest for our souls in Jesus Christ. The yoke of Jesus Jesus isn't a heavy wooden yoke like the oxen use. It's light because Jesus is on the other side providing all the strength and direction we need. Can you imagine life as a little bird? They fly around but they can't stay in the air forever. They need a place to land and rest. Does that describe your life this morning? Are you so tired of going and going and going and working and working and working? Do you need a place to land, to rest? Jesus used God's care of birds to illustrate the fact that we shouldn't worry. He said, consider the birds of the air, they don't work or worry, but your heavenly Father takes care of them. This is one of my favorite poems I learned as a young person growing up. 
you might have heard it, said the robin to the sparrow, I'd really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so, said the sparrow to the robin, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. It provides shelter from the weariness, or rest from the weariness of life. And then it provides shelter from the wrath of God's sin, or the wrath of God because of sin. Zephaniah chapter 2 verse 3 speaks to this. Seek the Lord, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. One day... God's wrath against sinful humanity will be poured out. Will you be sheltered? That Old Testament, perhaps you will find shelter, has been transformed into the New Testament certainty that Paul reminds us of in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The fire of God's wrath against sin has already fallen. That was at the cross of Jesus Christ. So if we want to be sheltered from God's wrath, we simply must stand on the ground that God already judged. Jesus took our punishment. Will you stand at the cross and accept the shelter Jesus provides? If not, you'll have to face the full brunt of God's judgment against sin. Rest, shelter, and protection and peace. Jesus continues to describe the multitude in heaven this way. In Revelation 7, 15 and 17, it says, They are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will spread His tent over them. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. In Jesus, in Jesus, we find help for today, for this moment, but also hope for tomorrow. God created us to spend eternity with Him in His prepared place we call heaven. C.S. Lewis once said, If I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. You and I, my friends, were made for another world. There is shelter in God's kingdom. A Sunday school teacher was teaching her class about heaven. She wanted them to understand how important it was to believe in Jesus to get to heaven. She asked the class, children, what do you have to do in order to go to heaven? And quickly, Johnny pulls up his hands and shouts out, you have to die. (laughs) It's true. You have to die. But more importantly, you have to have in Jesus Christ and what he has done for you on that cross. So what's the takeaway truth about the parable of the tiny mustard seed? Is it simply this? God delights to bring great things out of small beginnings. Sometimes the little spoken word at the right time to the right person has the huge impact. Jesus says to us today that we are to plant the seed, seed of faith, and let God worry about the growth. Our job, our responsibility, our calling is to plant the seed and reap the harvest. God is responsible for its growth. And that little kernel of faith which started out as as small as a mustard seed, continues to grow in us until the day Christ comes and calls us home. So 
bring your seed to Jesus today. And once that seed takes root and begins to grow, your lives, our lives become filled with the love of God. It is watered every time we love our neighbor or care for those in need or visit the sick, just as Jesus commanded us in Matthew 25, 36. Feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, visit the sick, and those in prison. Friends, God can take something like the tiniest of mustard seed, something insignificant, and he can transform it into something really big. He has done that with his kingdom as it continues to grow. He has done that in many of you. He can do that for all who will come to him by faith. Soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior. There's life more abundant and free. The writer of Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says to us, let us fix our eyes on Christ for it is through him that small faith does big things. It's worth repeating, let us fix our eyes on Christ for it is through him that small faith does big things. You see, he is the author he is the perfecter of our faith. What we need to do is turn our eyes upon Jesus. Take that little mustard seed in your hand. Look at it. Offer a prayer to Jesus. And should he be speaking to you this morning and saying, I need evidence this morning that this seed is doing what it was meant to do, that it is growing in your life. And perhaps he may be whispering to you this morning to take a step out in faith this morning and to come to this place of prayer and offer maybe for the first time or for the second or tenth time your allegiance to him. Greatest things happen in the smallest things if we are open and receptive to him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I invite you to come.